you're ready. I'm just gonna move this around. So again, welcome everybody to our final session of the studio track. So today we are gonna be looking at the advanced practices with studio and orchestrator. And I'll show you this wonderful agenda that we have. It's very exciting to talk about email automation and uh, how to uh, manipulate any string uh, using the methods that are available and uh, the date formatting and how to handle errors and also like how to use the orchestrator and get your project into the orchestrator. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up our session four. So let's dive into our session. So for today, the very first topic that we're going to talk about is uh, how to send emails using U UiPath Studio, okay? So UiPath Studio, like I said, it has like a whole or a, a large set of activities involved. And for the email, they have like a whole activities pack. So with the newer version of the studio, what you can do is you, you can create a very simple process and it comes with a mail activities. And if you don't see it, do not worry. You can always install this UiPath.mail activities from the package manager. And I'll, I'll show you that really quick, how to access that. So if you pull up your studio and let me just get this pop up out of the way. Okay, hope you can see my studio well, okay. So all I did was create a brand new process, a very simple process. And once you do that, uh, like I said, it will come with these default uh, packages. But if you don't see it, do not panic. Just go here, click on this manage packages button. And you can just like click on all packages and just search for mail. The moment you search for mail, you might be uh, having a whole large list, but just select this uipath.mail.activities. Uh, this is a pack activities pack that's provided by UiPath, okay? And again, like this comes in default, but if only if you don't have it, or if you want like additional packages, this is how you would install them. So that's about the mail packages. And whenever you use any of these mail activities, most of these uh, mails that are being used within the studio are represented by this type, which is called as mail message. So remember how we talked about in the variables there are different data types. You can have like string, integer, Boolean. For the mail, the data type for the mail is going to be of type mail message, okay? And while sending the uh, email, from studio, you have the option to configure a couple of items within your email. So you can like customize your email body and like choose whether you need to have attachments or not. And also like you can uh, customize your subject so that way you can like cater those emails depending on like what type of um, emails they are. Or, and like if you wanna add like additional information like date and time or any of the additional info. And also the best part that I love is like using a template. So with an email, like you can have like a standard uh, response that comes, you know, like one for the support or one for like, you know, once the process is completed, one that triggers something. So you can have like different templates and you can send emails based on those templates. And also, you know, like one additional thing that uh, you could use is HTML. So if you can like, you know, make your emails like stand out, like, with, you know, with all those, um, bold italics and like, you know, add colors and tables, you can use the HTML to do that for you. Okay, so um, if we go to studio and on the activities tab, if you just search for mail, these are the uh, list of mail activities that you would see. So they have like various different categories, like you could use the Outlook, which is mostly like 90% of us like have Outlook installed on our machine. So you can use the native Outlook application just to send those emails, or you can use the Exchange server or, you know, the IMAP, POP3, SMTP. And, you know, like, especially if you're working in an organization that has like, you know, lots of uh, web applications and like you have like integrated applications, I think in those areas, they would have used like, uh, you know, applications would trigger email and they do use this SMTP protocol to send out those emails. So you can like easily get those, like, you know, the port number and the server name and send out your emails using SMTP. So for today, we'll take a look at like how to use Outlook because Outlook, everybody has Outlook on your machine. And this way, like you can uh, send automated emails. Okay, and this is one of the easiest ones to configure. 
So let's dive in. Okay, so like I said, just pull up Studio and create a brand new process. And this is a very simple process, okay? So all I did was I created a brand new sequence. I named it Send Outlook Email, okay? So this is not like an activity. This is a name that I gave for my sequence. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like send a very static message, okay? So I'm gonna go to my activities panel and I will look for send email, okay? So as you can see, when I type like send, it pulls up like all the activities that are available to send email. So I'm gonna look for the specific send outlook mail message, okay? So I'll drag and drop this. And the moment I uh, use this activity, you see like it's asking me to configure who am I sending it to, what's the subject and what's the email body that I need. So these are all like the default things that you need to send an email, okay? So with that, like I'll use, you know, I'll make use of the variables that we learned in the past session to customize it. So that way, like I don't have to come to this activity every single time when I have to change the, um, you know, the sender or the mail subject. Instead, I'll just change it on the variable and that would reflect on the mail that we received. Okay. So all I have is I'm, I'm going to mail to myself. So I've just like put in my email here. And if you do have like multiple uh, usernames, like you have to mail multiple people, you can always do that. Just separate it with a semicolon and that always takes care of it. And, um, you know, in larger organizations, you guys might have this uh, distribution list or, you know, like uh, AD groups. You can also specify like the uh, group email addresses, the distribution list here, and that will also be taken care of. Like you can actually like, you know, send bulk emails as well. So it's a lot easier to do it this way. And so here's the mail subject that I'm specifying. So all I uh, did is use an assign activity and I created a variable that's called mail subject. And in the mail subject, I'm just stating that this is a test email, okay? And in the mail body, I'm gonna just say, hello, this is an email from your automation, okay? And once I have all that, then the next thing I do is like I type in those variables. So who am I mailing to? With that variable, the mail to, and the subject that we have, mail subject, and then the mail body, okay? So the mail body is this uh, string that we have here, all right? Now we are all set to send our email. So I'm just gonna delete this because I already have one activity here, okay? So I'm gonna run this. So this is a very simple, straightforward, just sending a test email, okay? And go back. It just takes a second every time we run this. Trying to flip back and it's done. Okay, it took less than four seconds to get this done. So I'm going to my inbox here. As you can see, I received the email with the message that says, this is an email from the automation. And this is a, a subject that we specified that it's a test email, okay? And this was my sender. So I'm using the Outlook activities to do that. Okay, now let's quickly see, like how can I use a template to do that for me? Okay, in this case, I'm just gonna like, I've just got a mocked up version of this. Okay, so I basically like have a text file. So in your project or anywhere, you can just like have a text file and I'm gonna access that text file. So I built a text file that says like, hello, and, you know, like using this zero basically means like I'm gonna replace that with any value that I want. So I can use that dynamically. So in this case, I'm gonna put in the username dynamically, okay? So I'm gonna say like, hello, user, your automation has completed successfully and regards the robot, okay? So this is a very simple text file, nothing fancy here. So I've just saved this text file and you can again, like just use a read text activity. So all I did was go to my activities and I look for read text file. Okay, so this one under the system file, you see this read text file. Once I drag and drop that, then you click on this browse file and you just have to select where your text file is. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the same folder, but it makes it a lot easier. Like 
for you to find it. But if you do have like a different structure, just go and select where your text file is. And once you're done selecting your text file, now you have to specify, you've read your text file, you have to store this in a variable, right? So if you click on this read text file, you would see the properties. On the output property, go ahead and click Control K and you would just create a variable where I'm gonna read all the information that's in that text file into a variable. And I'm calling my variable email template text, okay? And now again, we are gonna configure a different kind of subject this time. So previously we said this is a test email. This time my subject is going to be testing email templates. All right. And my send outlook activity is pretty much the same. So it's got the same user that I'm sending it to and I'm using the same variable. So as you can see, I'm not changing anything here, but for the body, all I'm going to do is I'm going to use, I'm going to show you just the different way because like in the previous one, we used a variable. Now I'm going to show you that how to use this area to send the email itself. So here you can just specify your string. Okay, I'm using a string method here that's called a format. So I'm calling in the email text uh, activity, the text file value that we just uh, saved in a variable. This is our variable and I'm passing in the current user. Remember how it said in the text file, where is that text file? Hold on a second. I'm just gonna pull up the second. Okay. Here we go. So here in our text file, we said like hello with a, uh, with a you know a placeholder. So this placeholder is now gonna be filled in with the value of the current user, or you can specify your username. So this is how you would like call in your current user. I'm just gonna use an environment variable that is you know like your system variable here. So all I did was use environment.username. This way it picks up who's the current user that's logged on to this machine, okay? So this is just to like, you know, show you a sample of like, how do I get the current user and send that email? So let's see like how this email works, okay? So I'm gonna send it again to my own Outlook, but this time with the current user. So I'm gonna close this template here. And if you do make any changes to that template, it's gonna reflect on your email as well. So just make sure like uh, what's the content that you wanna have in your template. Okay, it just takes a while. There it goes, it's done. We should be seeing our email here. Any second now, okay, there we go. So it says, uh, my computer user log on is Priya. So it says like, hello Priya, your automation has completed successfully. Okay, so if I make any changes to that template, that will be reflected in my email as well. Okay, now I told you that like you could also use HTML to, you know, modify those templates. So I'm gonna show you a quick example of how to use that HTML. So I have a different template this time. Instead of, you know, a simple text file, I'm just using the HTML tags. And this again, like you can modify any way that you want. You can use like any kind of HTML fonts or like for this instance, I'm gonna show you like how to incorporate, you know, a HTML table to display that, okay? So here's my body in the HTML that says, hi user, this is an auto-generated email. Okay, your uh, automation has completed successfully. It's basically the same thing. All I'm doing is just including another table. And this is like very simple HTML table. So I just used a header here and here's the value, okay? So what we're gonna do with our automation is I'm gonna replace this user with a current user and I'm gonna replace this total with a number. So that way you get like a value. So again, like you can use like any variable or like any uh, calculations that you do in your automation can also be emailed. So the results of your calculation can be sent out as an output in an email form, okay? So here again, we go, we use the read text file. And again, I use an output variable that's called email template text. And this time I just changed my subject slightly to say like testing email templates with HTML, okay? And for this one, remember like how our template showed us, um, hold on. how our template said, hi user, 
and uh, we are going to replace that user with a value. So this tag that says user, it's not like, you know, a HTML native tag. This is just like a customized user tag. So I'm just going to use that to replace. OK, so all I'm doing is go to your activities. I'm going to use an activity called as replace. OK. So this is how your activity would look like. And just for, you know, uh, debugging and like, you know, uh, tracking along, I think naming your activities is a very good practice. So I'm just going to call it replace. When I double click, it just <laughs> it just pulls up that specific activity. OK, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to use the display name here. I'm just going to say replace username. OK, and as you can see in the properties, it wants an input. So now I need to specify what is the input, the string value that needs to be replaced. OK, so the input that we are going to provide is the template that we just read from this text file. So I'm going to say that email template text, the variable that we created. And now I'm going to specify the pattern. The pattern that I'm going to replace, like what is it that I want to be replaced? What is the pattern that we are looking to replace? So in this case, I want to replace this tag that says user. So anywhere in that HTML file, wherever it says user, it's going to replace that value. OK, so what is the replace uh, replacement instead of user? What do I want to say? I can say Jane Doe here. OK. And in the result variable, where do I want this to be stored? So I want to use the same HTML uh, text value that we have. So I'm going to call the same variable that's called email template text. So that way, use that. So I already had this configured. I'm just going to remove that one. OK, so now it's called Jane Doe. OK, I'm going to do the same steps, but just for the results this time. So as you can see, I again like uh, dropped in a replace activity. I'm going to call the same text uh, variable, which is the email template text. And I'm going to call the tag, which is called the total. And again, these are user defined. You can name your tags anything that you want. And I'm going to, instead of um, what is my total, what is it the number that I want to be displayed? I'm just going to say five and use the same variable. So now our template that just came from that HTML text is going to hold on to these values. OK, so this variable is holding on to everything. OK. So I'm going to use a send outlook mail message, use those variables, the mail to mail subject. And for the body, I'm going to pass our modified uh, variable, which is this email template text again. OK, so this time I should be able to see. Hi, Jane Doe, this is your total number of transactions. OK, let's see this in action. And I have this open. So we should be seeing that email anytime soon. And again, like sometimes my studio takes a little bit to, you know, kick off. So it just needs some motivation, I guess. And our outlook, it just takes a few seconds. And as you can see, the email arrived. So here it says, hi, Jane Doe, this is an auto generated email. And here's your automation has completed successfully. And this is the table that we built using our HTML. So it's that simple to just like send emails. And you can think of like various scenarios when you need to like send emails. So there are multiple uh, times that you might need to send an email. So you might finish some calculations and you want to send a report. You can use the attachment here, like right here in this um, send outlook. You can uh, pass in an attachment attachment file name here, and you can enable for the HTML for the tags that we specified. You just need to enable this property that says, is body the HTML? Check this box, okay? So that way your HTML text gets activated. Otherwise, it's gonna give you all those tags. So it's a lot easier to use this uh, checkbox right here. And sometimes if you want to have your automation draft those emails and you make those decisions, for sending those emails or you want to add additional things, but you want like a base, uh, you know, a draft email, you can use this uh, property here that says is draft and check this box right here. 
So that way, this email will not be sent out to the user. Instead, it will be placed on your draft with that um, sender's information right there. So all you have to do is review your email once it's vetted out and you've um, made sure that all the information is there or all the files are there, and then you can send it out yourself. So any questions, again, feel free to use the chat, okay? So that was about our email automation. Now I'm gonna show you about how to uh, manipulate string variables. We all use, like once you start automating, building your automations within Studio, we all will be like using variables that are of string type. So, which is like very common. I, I can like really vouch that there's not like, <laughs> there's gonna be like 99.9% .9 of automation are gonna have these string variables. So there's like very, um, it's a very common type of variable that you would use in your studio. And for every automation, it comes in really handy. So here's an example. Uh, here's uh, how you learn, where you learn how to use these uh, string variables and make it more powerful for your automation. So these can be used to, the string data that we get are like coming from various applications or you're like manipulating and you're getting from a different application and you need to send it to another application. This is where the string manipulation comes into place. So here I have a link to the Microsoft documentation. So what we have done is uh, I've learned that UiPath has uh, leveraged Microsoft string methods and that is the base which is being used as the framework to build their string method. So if you know like, you know, any of the string methods, this is exactly the same that we use in UiPath as well. So it's a lot easier, okay? So if you do have a string that you need to like concatenate and just like add them together and like present it as one object, you can use this method called as concat, okay? It just simply means concatenation, okay? And then uh, the next thing is, contains method. This method is used to check whether a string contains a certain value. So if you have a large, um, you know, a paragraph and you just wanna see if that paragraph contains this word test, then you can use this contains method to check that for you, okay? And uh, this one will return a true or false. So it's gonna tell you whether it's a yes or no, like whether it contains it or not, okay? And the next method that we have is the format method. So this, this is one of the method that I just like showed you in the uh, emailing part where I did use this is to format my string and replace that placeholder with an actual value from the variable, okay? So this basically like is a, it converts an entire expression in whatever format that is into a string type, okay? So that way it becomes like a lot more readable and it also gives you the flexibility to like uh, make your variables, uh, make your string value more dynamic, okay? So you can use this format to replace that placeholders with an actual value. So what we do is like, you can use the zeros and ones. So if you put zero, it's gonna like collect the first variable. If you have one, it's gonna use the second variable. So if you do have a two, you can add another variable here. So it goes in the sequential order, like it goes in the same order that you specify. So be cautious with numbering these um, placeholders, okay? And then I'm gonna try to move this up. Let's take this uh, zoom controls when it gets in the way. Okay, so the next method that we have is the index of. So you can have a large string and you want to find out when is the first occurrence or um, you know a specific occurrence of a certain character. So if I have a word, uh, you know, like orange, and I wanna know like, when does this A, the character A occurs, you can always find that. So you can not just use characters, you can also use like a certain word, you know, a couple of characters as well. Okay. And the next method that we have is the join method. With the join method, you can have like, imagine you have a collection that is like an array or like a list and you want to just display them as like one string. That is where you can use this join method and uh, use that and say like, what's your separator and specify what's your collection variable. That way you can see like, okay, all the elements in the array can be displayed in, the, in, in just a simple string format. Okay, and we also use the replace method. I showed you like there's an activity within Studio 
or you can use this method. So you can call the variable and say dot replace and you can specify what's the original text that that's already out there and what do you want it to be replaced with okay so that way like you will see this value being replaced out there okay and the next method that we have is the split method in the split method all you can do is like imagine you are scraping from a website and you want to like take that value and find out like line by line and each line can be like separated by this kind of or operator then you can say like, okay, I want to split that variable by this or, and then find out, okay, I want only the first part of before that pipe symbol, or like, I want to see the second part. Then you would say like you would in the place of the index, you would specify zeros or one kind of value, okay? And in the case of a substring, so substring is a very interesting activity that comes in handy in most of our automation is mainly because like you can always get like a part of the string instead of like capturing the whole string. So it's it's usually like very easy to extract only a portion of a string and like using finding that index and like specifying like how long of that character that you want. This is a very useful uh, string method that's being used in most of our automations. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a quick demo. I won't switch. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so. Again, I went ahead and built a new sequence here and I'm calling it the string manipulation. And I'm just gonna disable the rest of it so that like we see one activity at a time. Okay, sorry, just hold on with me. Okay, so the first method that we're going to take a look is at the concatenation. Okay, so all I'm going to do is like I'm just going to use instead of, you know, like you could use this in various places, you could use this in properties, using assign activities, and I chose to use the log message. Okay, so I'm just going to print this value out there for you. So I'm going to use the string dot concat. And I'm going to place like what's the first value that I'm going to say is hello. And the second value that I'm specifying is word. And I'm also using a third value here that I'm that says I'm here. OK, so if I run this, it's going to combine all these three and give it as like one simple string. So let's see how that comes out. That's it. Okay, so it did come back here that says like, hello world, I'm here. So now as you can see, it just like printed as like one simple string. So that's the magic of a uh, concat method. Okay, so let's go to the next one, which is the replace. So we all saw in the outlook here, how we use the replace activity, right? Very similar to that. It's exactly the same concept. So this replace is being built based on this uh, Microsoft method. So as you can see, I'm just gonna specify a very simple string, okay? I'm just gonna like create a test kind of string. This is a sample text that says, John is an accountant and John has two dogs, okay? So this is my string. From this string, I just wanna replace the character John with Jake, okay? So in that case, I'm just gonna say, call my string variable here. Currently my string variable that we uh, used our sample text is called test string. So I'm gonna call that variable and say dot replace. And I'm gonna specify what's my original value, which is John and what it should be replaced as J, okay? So let's run this one. So when we see our output, instead of saying John is an accountant, it should say Jake is an accountant and Jake has two dogs. Come on. There we go. 
So as you can see in this output panel right here, it says Jake is an accountant and Jake has two dogs. So you can like easily like replace. So this is if you all have used like Excel and you use this uh, find and replace, this is very similar to that, okay? So you can use like uh, to replace all the occurrences using the replace method, okay? The next thing that I'm gonna use is an index of, how do I find the specific index of a certain character? Okay, so for that, I'm going to use a different text message this time. I'm going to call it like your Amazon, you know, we all uh, have ordered online and you would receive this auto-generated email that says like your Amazon order is this and it has been shipped and it will arrive on this certain date. Okay, so if you've seen that text, I'm calling, I'm storing it in a variable called a sample text. And I'm gonna get that index, okay, of where that order number starts, okay, where wherever they have that number sign, the hashtag, I'm gonna find the index of that, which index meaning the position, like from that string, what is the count? Where is where does it hold that hashtag in that string? Okay. So I'm gonna call that samples text and just say, like if you hit, sorry. I'm just gonna say sample text. And if I just say like index of, if you just put the dot and you know, like studio has this intelligence to pull up like all the methods. So the moment you start typing, it would like pull up all the different methods out there. So I'm gonna use the index of method and I'm gonna specify the character hashtag here, okay? And I'm gonna use an integer variable to hold that because remember it's a position. A position, it's in, in the form of a number, okay? so. To store that position, I'm going to use a variable that's called order index. And as you can see, that order index is of type integer. Okay. So it's coming in the form of a number. Okay. Now I want to print and see like, okay, what's the position? I'm just, uh, I just need to use it for further processing. Then I will just need to see what's the position here. Okay. So the moment we run it, it's going to give us like, what's the position? Okay, so here it goes, it says it's 22. Okay, next we will leverage this for our uh, substring as well. So now like, so let's see like how to use the substring method. So you're gonna use the same sample text. I'm just gonna call that substring and I'm gonna specify that index that we just found, okay? And using that index, I'm gonna specify like after that index, there are like six character order number and I wanna extract that specific order number. So I'm specifying that index and also like what's the length of the character, which is this, uh, I want the next six characters, okay? And as you can see, like one of the best practices that I would say is like whenever you're dealing with any extractions or any type of string that comes from a, form, a source that you're unsure, like whether it has like, you know, extra spaces, because like when it comes to the string format, it can take into account like all the additional space. So it can have space before the string or after, and it can have like infinite number of spaces. So which is where I love to use the trim method. Trim method basically like cuts out like all the additional space and gets you just the ex uh, exact string. And it doesn't remove the spaces in between the sentence. It only trims in the uh, prior to the string and at the end of the string, okay? So in this case, I'm just saying like, give me just that order number. I don't want anything else. So I'm storing that in a variable called as order number. And I'm just using a simple string here. So if we run this, we should get that order number from our sample text. Okay, it's gonna come up in a second. And again, this substring method can be used in n number of ways to extract only a part of the string. So as you can see, here's our sample text that says, this is our entire string and I only want this order number, okay? So here we have our order number. Okay, so the last string method that I'm going to show you is the split method. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, close out all the other ones. Just move it in. So that way we don't get confused with our outputs that we are seeing. Okay, so I'm going to use another sample text. 
because for the split method, I want to show you how does it work if I'm going to have like multiple lines of string. OK, imagine you're scraping off of a website that has this kind of multi line feature. OK, so here it says uh, it gives an information about a person. OK, here the name is Iron Man and his title is Mr. The age and the location and the gender. OK, now I want to split and I only want to find the name. OK, so for me, just to get this value that says Iron Man, it's a lot easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first split it only by the first line. So I want only the first line there. So I'm calling my string variable that holds that entire text, second sample, and I'm gonna use the split method, okay? And for me to like find out like, you know, the line breaks, like how I can find only the first line, I'm gonna use this variable called environment.newline. And you know, with the split method, it always goes by characters, okay? So it's always advisable to use the dot two character array. OK, and this is an additional, you know, trick that I use is to remove the empty entries. Imagine if that kind of information holds an empty line and I don't want to have that information. In that case, I would use this option that says string split options and just say dot remove entries. OK, so now we've split based on the next line. OK, so if there are line breaks, I've split based on that. So now we have like five items, okay? Out of that five items, I only want the first one. And when you split, it goes in the form of an array. So if you know the concept of arrays, the arrays are numbered with like starting from zero. So it doesn't start with one, two, three. It starts with zero, one, two, three, okay? So in that case, now that I have like a couple of five items here, I want just the first item. So I'm gonna say zero. Okay, so zero meaning I'm trying to access the first element from the array. Okay, and I'm putting that into a string variable here, one line. Okay, so that's just the first line. Okay, and we'll print that first line. And then once that is printed, I also want to split. Now that I have that first line, as you can see in the name, it says like name colon Ironman. And I only want the name of that person. Okay, so in that case, I'm gonna use the string that we just got the result, which is the one line. And again, I'm gonna split it once again this time, but not in terms of a new line, but in terms of the colon, okay? So I'm gonna split it by this colon. And in this case, like I'll just use the, instead of dot, I can do either dot two character array, or I can just use that C, okay? And this time, once I split by colon, it's split into two, two parts, okay? It has the name, which is prior to the colon. And after the colon, it has the, person's name, which is Iron Man, okay? So now I have two parts. Out of these two parts, I only want the actual value, which is the name of this person, okay? So in this case, as we know, the array starts from zero, zero, one, two, three. I want the value, the second value, okay? Here, you know the second value meaning one, okay? So I'm gonna specify one. And again, I love to trim because like if there are empty spaces, we just eliminate that, okay? So now we print the name of that person. So let's see how the split function works. My studio just came back. Okay, there we go. So here's our first split, which is the first line named on Iron Man, and then like the first value itself. So here it prints what's the uh, name of that person. All right, Diana, over to you. This is the most fun time. Okay, so I just put the Mindy quiz code in the um, chat window. So if you guys want to go ahead and register for that, we'll wait for a few people to join. We've had a really good participation this week. Keep them coming. And remember guys, the fastest finger wins. That's right. Okay, I'll wait for just a few more to join. Y'all wanna get on this. Good. 
We love the icons. Awesome. Okay, let's get started. Oops. Which string method can be used to replace all the occurrences of a substring in a string? Is it delete all, replace, outsource, or format? Replace, good job. Okay, let's see who's leading us tonight. Good job, Brittany. Okay, and are you ready for the next question yet, Priya? Not yet. So okay. we'll move on to the next section now. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay, hope you all can see my screen. So we're going to learn about date formatting. Okay. So we saw like how to send emails, right? So when we send our emails, you know, it's always like very um, informative to input like your date time. So you can say like this automation completed on this day at this time, which gives like more information for the reader. Whoever's reading that will know like, okay, this is the time that the automation completed. So if they have to like, you know, if they have at any point that you need to like go back and trace when was this process completed, you always have like some kind of track to, you know, like look in your output here. Okay, so uh, when we talk about the date formats, all the dates within this uh, UiPath Studio is stored in a variable of type date time, okay, system dot date time. And that variable is what you will be using to convert. So if you need to print like today's date, all we need to do is use this date time dot now. And then you can set like now, meaning that it gives you that entire, like, let's say like it's August 12, 247, I mean like, central time sorry central time and it's going to display with the seconds so this like if you just print to um two string you will see like this entire thing being printed okay so you can like format that date into any specific format depending on like any kind of uh, global region that we are at we all use different formats so you can either say the date coming first or the uh, month coming first you can switch that up or you can use like, you know, uh, dashes or like, if you use uh, three M's, meaning like two M's is like just the month, the number of the month. But if you use three M's, it's gonna spell out the name of the month with just those three letters. And if you want the entire word of the month, just put four M's. So that way you get the whole month being spelled out, okay? And we can specify the hour and the minutes and if you notice the minutes and the month they all have the same character m and m but uh, to differentiate which is where the upper case for the month and the lower case for the minute so be cautious there and notice like what kind of m are you using in your date formats okay and uh, a couple of methods that we use, like uh, let's say you have a string that holds this kind of date format and you want that string to be converted into that system dot date time, which is like a date time data type of that variable. You can use this method that says like convert dot to date time and you specify your string. In this method, you just like imagine you just put in like today's date, then this is how it would look like. And you can store it in a, using an assign. And on the opposite side, you can just create a daytime variable and store it there, okay? Instead of using this convert.toDaytime, you can also use this parse exact, meaning that you know exactly like which uh, date format that you wanna uh, put into. Then you can use the input string, which is like your date, and what's the format of that one? And uh, what's the next format that you want to specify? So uh, if you want to be like, you know, um, culture independent, you can just use this variable that's the system.globalization culture info and say like invariant culture. That way you can either like specify, uh, you know, a region specific culture. Like, you know, uh, if you're in like Europe, you specify different st uh, structure. 
whereas in the US, like you use a different structure, okay? And the result, you can again store it in a date time variable here, okay? So, So I have a simple activity here, okay? So I'm gonna show you, okay, I'm gonna show you first how to print today's date, okay? And you know, like in terms of printing activities, my favorite is the log message, okay? So that way, like if you're using Orchestrator, you can still like see these logs because if you use message box, it kind of like uh, comes in the way. And sometimes when you're using multiple screens, I cannot find that pop-up. <laughs> So this is my personal preference is using that log message, okay? So that's why I'm gonna print that today's date using the log message. So in my log message, I'm specifying a string saying like today's date and time are, and how to get the date. I'm gonna use this date time. So I'll print that out for you. All I'm gonna do is like using that date, I'm just gonna say date, now date time, and then I'm gonna use the now now method here okay and you can either specify the job to string and as you see like while you type it tells you like do you want the short string or the short time or you can specify your own like string type so i'm gonna say like i just want the month out and then i'm gonna specify the date here i'm just gonna put y y y okay so it's gonna like print today's date in that specific format that we requested There we go. So it printed it out here that says like today's date and time are, it spelled out the month since I specified the triple M in uppercase and it put the date here and then the year. Okay, now we are gonna see. Now I'm gonna show you an example of how you can convert this date time, okay? So I'm gonna use a string variable here. So this is a test date time, date string here, that is of type string, okay? In that string variable, I'm gonna specify today's date in this format. I'm gonna use the month. Instead of like, you know, the forward slash, I'm just using a hyphen a little dash here and then put the date and then a little dash and then the year, okay? So now I want this string to be converted to a date um, date time format, okay? So I'm gonna use the first method, which is the convert dot to date time. And it's very simple. I just pass that string variable here, okay? And the result, I just need to create a variable and make sure the type, the variable type is gonna be of date time, okay? And then we're just gonna like print this value and see like whether it converted. Okay, so now I have that date time. I just need to validate whether it was able to convert it. Okay, and once it's in the date time format and while you're printing, especially if you're using log message, just remember that these log messages take the string input. So again, like when I'm using log messages, I had to like go back and convert it back to a string. So as you can see, it converted to a date time. I'm just printing that date time here. It says like 8, 12, 2022. 20, okay. And here's an example of how to use that parse exact method. Okay. So the same string uh, test date string that we just created, I'm going to show you how to convert it to a date time format. Okay. So just call the date time and call the parse exact method. And the first argument that you're gonna specify is the test string that we created, okay? I'm gonna pass that and I'm gonna specify what's the format. And like we mentioned, remember that culture variable? So you're gonna like call that property here, system.globalization.cultureinfo, and I can say the invariant culture because I'm not gonna specify any culture specific info here. I'm just gonna make it like universal. Right? I'm, I'm just gonna make it like neutral. And then I just print that final date, okay? So last thing, if you run that, you know, my studio is kind of slow. If you all have like better machines, it should be faster, okay, I promise. So as you can see, using the date time, like I just use the print, say, and as you can see, the output is converted to a date time format. 
Okay. Again, you can play around this daytime format in multiple different ways, and you can customize it to your specific needs of your automation. Okay. And I'm going to pass the ball over to Diana for another fun question. Okay, so I'm putting the Minty number back in the chat in case anybody needs it. Okay, ready? Don't forget to answer fast. Which method is used to get the current date and time in the studio? Is it look at your watch, ask, ask Alexa, date, time, now, use a sundial? All right. Everybody got that right. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Good Diana, answer. you triggered my Alexa here. Yeah, that's funny. Let's see, Brittany, if you were able to hold your position or did someone, oh my God, Jenna's right there Very behind close. you. That's right. <laughs> Great. Okay, you want me to stop there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Diana. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's really cool to know that like you guys are really listening. So I can see from the quiz like how active you are. So you're gonna love this part about the debugging and exception handling. So now that you've known like, you know, how to get your hands dirty with all this uh, string manipulation and the date formatting, you know, you might run into errors the first few times that you're fumbling upon all these different types. So don't worry if you do have those errors. Here, this next section is gonna help you out. Like, how can I handle those errors? And like, how do I find what's causing that error? Because that's the whole concept of debugging to identify what's causing that error. and. I'm gonna show you what are the different uh, options that are available within Studio for you to perform that debugging, okay? So the concept again of debugging is basically for you to identify what's causing these errors, okay? And how do I even like uh, handle these errors? Like what do I do when an error occurs, okay? So when you have a project like that you're building and you want to see like, how can I debug, sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> sorry about that so uh, thanks Logan so if you do have like your studio open you will see the top three uh, tabs right so on the third tab you would see the debug okay if you pull up that ribbon you would see a lot of options available for you to perform the debugging okay so the very first step like if you want to run your file in a debugging mode is to select that file like if you're on that uh, specific file that you are in you can just use this drop down to say like debug so if you say like debug it's, you know, just use the debug option, it's gonna run the entire project, okay? But if you say debug file, it's only gonna run the current file. And again, like that can be changed. So don't worry, like if you see like different options here. So for me, it says run file. So you might have a different setting. So if you do have that, it's okay. It's a configurable option that you all choose. And if you do wanna change the default options, you can always like just go to your settings, and just say like, there's that design. And right here, where it says run and debug default behavior. If you are like a developer that's running into like a lot of issues and you always wanna like debug and like test your project, you can choose like, what's your favorite option here? So in my case, I like to run and see it. Like if I want to debug, I will always go back and change it, okay? And you don't have to come and change this configuration every time. So this is just a default behavior. In my case, I chose the run file. Okay, so that's why I see the run file here. So if you go to the debug option and you choose this drop down, 
you can always say like debug file, meaning that you run only the specific file or you run the entire project, meaning that it starts from the main, the main workflow itself, okay? So the moment we hit debug, like you're gonna be presented with a lot of options. Like I said, this whole ribbon is available for you to uh, run this in debug mode, okay? So here are a couple of actions that are available. So the very first one, like once you hit debugging, it goes into like a kind of a slow motion because a runtime is that executes like on the moment, like it goes like a way faster, but in debugging, you're running in like your local compile mode, meaning that you will be like checking every single thing. So for you to like slow down and check every single activity, the very first one is to uh, step into like each of those activity, like check one activity at a time and see like which one is causing the error. And the moment you hit an error, you know, like you will be highlighted and you will be like stop right there, okay? And the next option that we have is a step over. Imagine you have this long workflow and you know, like you kind of, um, in uh, you kind of have this intuition of where this error is occurring. Maybe it's not happening in the first section, but probably at the bottom. And you just want to like skip over a couple of activities, not dive into like each of those activities. You can use the step over, meaning that like it executes all the activities without like even like going in detail, like not just going into every single thing. Okay, and then the step out is basically like, uh, it just like executes, completes that execution in that current container and then pauses at that level. And then the retry basically re-executes what it did in the previous activity and so that you can capture like, what's that exception that occurred? Because if you miss that and you just wanna see it, you can use the retry, okay? And the ignore option basically is to like, um, you know, continue from then uh, whatever the exception that occurred, it's just gonna completely ignore that and move forward and start from the next activity and it proceeds with the automation, okay? And the restart activity is where the debugging starts from the very first activity in that project. Okay, so here are a couple of my favorites as well. So the very first thing that I always use when I'm debugging is a breakpoint. Okay, so when you see this breakpoint, you can just like, these are like toggles, okay? So let's say like, I want to like uh, check this specific action and I think that's where it failed or I want to check from that certain point. You can just put like, a, you know, imagine that you're using like a big red marker to say like, this is the point that I want to start checking from. So that's what this breakpoint does. It gives that red marker with a big red dot. So it puts a red dot on your activity to show you that like, okay, this is where like, I'm gonna stop and like uh, use those previous actions. You can either slow step, meaning that you can like slowly, like slow down your execution and watch and like highlight each of those steps using that slow step. And the execution trail basically like shows you that exact um, path at which you're debugging at. And the highlight elements is basically like it gives you like, a, you know, a yellow highlight around like the activities that are currently being uh, debugged, okay? And the log activities, as you can see, like you can see those um, logs being displayed in the orchestrator or like, you know, like at the trace logs in your output panel itself, okay? And this continue on exception. This is like a unique one, you know, like when you enable this, when an exception is like uh, being logged, it still like continues with that exception. So like it, it it holds that exception, but like it still doesn't like stop it like completely. So like it will like, once you check this, like it still like proceeds with the automation. So as we see, so let's say like I, uh, I wanna like just debug this uh, date formatting that we just saw, okay? So I want to say like, okay, from this test ring, I feel like something might be wrong. So I want to drop a breakpoint here. So I'm on this debug um, debug ribbon here. I'll just click on this breakpoint. You see, there's the big red dot that I was talking about. And if you don't want that breakpoint, you can always like click on that and twice and it just like vanishes. So if you wanna like, let's say you have like debugged so many times and you're not sure like where those breakpoints are, Again, like you can just come back to this uh, drop down under the breakpoints and you can see that whole panel. So it will display all the different breakpoints that you have placed in your project. So let's say, like, if I just like place a breakpoint right here, 
and I'll have like another one here. You can see that it will tell you like very exactly like what activity and what file path that breakpoint is. And one thing that I want to point out is like, as you can see here, it just displays the activity name, which is why it's very, very important for you to troubleshoot with your activities being named correctly. So if you want to name your activities the moment you write it. So in this case, I want to say like, this is like a test string. Let's see. Okay. As you can see now, when you see, okay, now I know like which assign it's talking about. Because like if it just says assign, assign is a common activity name. It's just the default, okay? I can have like hundreds of assigns in my project, but I will never be able to figure out like which assign is it talking about. So that's why always name your activities. Okay. And this breakpoint panel is very useful for you to view and like toggle along. And if you do want to like delete a couple of breakpoints, you can also do it from here and you can just select them and just like delete them. So those breakpoints are really useful. So I'll just show you like when I run this and debug, like what happens. So I'm just going to like debug the specific one. So my machine is like slow by default. So with debugging, it's just going to slow down a little bit, okay? So as you can see, it's gonna run the automation and it's gonna like stop right there in that assign. Meaning that like from there on, it comes, it gives control back to me saying like, okay, now you take care of it and you see like what you want to do, okay? So now I have like the option to say like, okay, step into each of this so that I can see like what's happening and what are those different actions that are available, okay? So here, um, as you can see, like as it executes, I can just go to the locals window. It This locals, so on this uh, left-hand side, you will see like the moment you start debugging, you get presented with like various options, okay? The favorites of mine is this locals window. So with this local window, it presents you what's the value of that, uh, of all the variables in that file currently at that specific moment, okay? So like if uh, we have this variable called as test string, right? So this value was here. What if I had like changed this value? So this locals window gives me like, what's the current exact at that specific point in time, what's the value, okay? And you can always like step over. And like, once you say like, okay, I figured out like where the problem is, then I can either hit continue or stop. And then like, you can go back to like fixing your errors and then like uh, proceed again, like to either debugging or running. Okay, so like I said, there are three panels that come up and this locals panel gives you like the actual value of your variables and the properties that you have def defined. And the next, uh, next panel that you see is the immediate panel. This can be like, again, like it's just used for like inspection of that specific point in time. And there's this call stack panel that again, like just displays the next activity that's like ready to be executed or called. And we talked about the breakpoints panel and the watch panel is where you say like, okay, I want to display a specific variable. So you can call those variables and say like, tell me what those values are. So that's just for you to see them. Okay. And uh, moving on to exception handling. Now that we know like how to debug, you need to understand what's like, what's causing like what's an error versus an exception, okay? So sometimes like when you see there are like errors like that your program cannot handle with, that it has not seen like in the past, then that is called an except, uh, is called an error, okay? So whenever uh, you're running into something and like your page stops loading, have you seen this uh, server 400 errors? Like sometimes when you go to a website and then it hits there and it sits there like loading, loading. And after a while, it just gives you that server 400. So that's an error. But when it comes to exception, exceptions are events that are like, you know, recognized by your system. So let's say you are programmatically like defining the rules of like what can be an exception and you can categorize them into two buckets, okay? One is the system exception, meaning that like all the application related uh, exceptions that are being raised can be caught under system exception. Whereas business exceptions are rules that you define for the process. 
in terms of your business standpoint. So functionally, like, let's say, like, I want um, when this event, let's say, um, if you're getting the mark of like, you know, you're calculating students grades, and let's say like mark greater than like 80%. At that point, I want to throw an exception to say like, okay, um, this needs to be handled manually, or this needs a certain review, I can throw a business exception there. So that's just an example. And, and you can think of like various scenarios on what your business rules are and define those in those business exceptions, okay? So there are a couple of activities that Studio provides in, our, in terms of like handling those exceptions. And the first one, the most common one is called the try catch activity, okay? So any activity can be like encapsulated using this try catch. So this try catch basically like gives you an option to say like you perform certain activities in this try block right here. And when whenever an exception occurs and you define like what type of exception, either it can be the system exception, which is like the common one, or you can say like business exception. In that catch block, you can define what I should do when that exception occurs. So you do your actions in the try, and then in the catch part, you do the rectification action. So when the error, like when the action happens, like let's say you're browsing certain areas, you're typing in information, you're inputting like data to a certain system. And when you reach a certain point, let's say a pop-up appears from that system and that says like, okay, you need like this specific um, value. Or if that's like a business rule that you have defined, in that case, you would choose the exception type as business exception. And you can either like choose to um, throw it or like, you know, like handle it in like various ways. And like you manually like don't stop the execution of your process. Instead, it's been handled more gracefully. Okay. And then this try catch block also comes with the finally part. Okay. So if you have a dark night experience or like any other programming, like this kind of like should feel similar. So if you've used Visual Studio, this is kind of the same concept. So this finally block is nothing but whenever like all these actions are uh, specified, like you do all these actions, you still want to execute something, then you would put it under the finally block. So regardless of whether an exception occurs or not, this finally block will be executed. Okay. So that was our first uh, activity, the try catch. And the second one is the throw. So this throw is where you can use it to like throw a certain uh, custom errors. So remember how we talked about the business rule exceptions? You can use this to throw your business rule exceptions. So you can just say like, okay, I want a new business rule exception. Then you can just use that. Like, what is the message that you wanna say? Like, what is your business rule exception? You can define that message and then throw it. The rethrow is basically like, okay, you have like a try catch, you've like thrown your exception, but you have like a parent workflow that handles all of that errors. Like imagine you wanna like uh, email all those exceptions to like a support team or something. Then in that case, you can use that rethrow activity to handle it by like a different uh, handler, okay? Uh, let me just quickly show you before we move on. So imagine like I'm just gonna like type into a notepad, okay? And for me to type into a notepad, um, maybe. Okay, so I don't have notepad open right now, but I'm just gonna type in. And if that notepad is not open, let me just delete this breakpoint. Okay, that's out of the way. So all I'm gonna do is like use the try catch, okay? So let's imagine like this is the only activity that I uh, put in there that says, okay, type into this. I can use this uh, type into like and encapsulate it with a try catch. So here's how you do it. Go to an activity that or like a sequence or like a series of activities that you wanna like encapsulate and safeguard with like a try catch mechanism. Then all you can do is just right click and just say surround with try catch, okay? The moment you do that, as you can see, it gives you this option, okay? Now I have an error because I haven't defined how to handle that exception. So you at least need to have one catch 
in order for your uh, for this error to go away. Okay, so you can always like go back and specify that since I already have it defined. I'm just going to show you how it's being defined. Okay. There we go. So all I did was like, I just chose the exception as like basic system dot exception. And I'm just gonna like use a log message, okay? Of error type, okay? There are different log levels. And again, like you can read the documentation on the different logging mechanisms, because like you can use like various different logs in terms of like how you wanna handle them. In this case, I'm just gonna use it as error type. And I'm gonna give a message that says like, okay, type into notepad is failed, okay? So currently I don't have the notepad open. So it's supposed to just do that. And at the end, like I have a finally block, which is gonna be executed regardless of whether I have an exception or not. Okay. Hello, my studio is kind of slow today, but it's gonna do it. So as you can see, it caught that exception because like it couldn't find the notepad, it cannot type into that. So it caught that as an exception and it threw that message that we gave saying like type into notepad has failed. And then the finally block where we had that message box that's being displayed, okay? So in this case, like my automation did not stop per se, instead like it exited gracefully giving me this message, okay? And if I had to use a throw activity, I'll just show you like in this case, like I have an if condition to say like, imagine this is your business rule. I'm just like having an array to say like, okay, I just wanna make sure that like, uh, you know, like a value mod two is like, you know, it's divisible by two. In that case, I'm just trying to find if it's an even number or an odd number. And in this case, if it's an odd number, I wanna raise an exception saying like, hey, we have a problem then like I would use this throw activity. So I would just go to my activities and look for throw. And as you can see, there are two here. This is the uh, rethrow and throw. I'm gonna use the throw, okay? Because we haven't, uh, again, you would use a rethrow once an exception is caught. In this case, this is the first time that we are raising an exception. So I would use the throw activity, okay? So I'm gonna say throw. And I'm gonna define my first business rule exception. So I'll say like new business rule exception. And again, this is a syntax, okay? So this is like you're defining a constructor here. So you would put that and say like my business rule that I'm saying is this item is an odd number, okay? So if you run this, when the loop is running, it's gonna throw an error, okay? And this is gonna kind of stop the, uh, stop the automation with that uh, throw message, mainly because you're just throwing an exception, but it's not being handled. So as you can see, the exception occurred and you can see the message here that it says item is an odd number, okay? And here's where like, if we had like encapsulated this in a try catch, or if I had like put that try catch and then say like rethrow this and handle it in a different workflow, then the rethrow would come into place, okay? So let's see how our next mentee question goes. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. You ready? Question three. Which debug action sustains the execution when an exception occurs? Is it don't stop at errors, continue on exception, turn off and on, or reset? Oh, nice. You guys are good. Uh oh, competition. <laughs> wow, guys, I'm telling you, this mentee can like swap like any time. So, it again, can. you do have another chance to win at this. That's right. Okay. I'm going to pass it back to you, Priya. Thank you, Dinah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna share again. Okay, can you all see my screen now? Yes. Sweet, okay, thank you. So now it's time for us to learn like how to use the orchestrator assets. So, so far you've been like building your automation, like you've been like handling all those string, like you've been, you know, uh, configuring everything like locally. Imagine if you can like store some of this in the orchestrator and leverage like what's available from the orchestrator. So I'm gonna talk first about the assets, okay? So assets are a component of the orchestrator which are basically used to configure values. So imagine a um, web application. So if you all have, uh, have been involved in any kind of like software development, and if we build like any kind of product, there's always a configuration to it. And that configuration comes along with that product itself. And for us to change that configuration, meaning that like it can change the way like how it runs or what time it runs and you know, like any kind of configuration. So these configurations are gonna be around your automation. Okay, so you can define like certain values on like what uh, what kind of, you know, what systems to use, what URLs to put in, what credentials, or like what values, like any kind of configuration can be stored in these assets, okay? And using these assets, it's, it's not just being like locally embedded within your workflow, meaning that you don't have to every single time open up studio, change your XAML, to change those configurations. This is this orchestrator asset gives you the capability to uh, becomes like that centralized location where you can just go there and change those values and forget about opening studio and changing it. So this gives you like a centralized uh, admin kind of portal, okay? And with the orchestrator assets, you have like four different data types that you can use. So you can store like, uh, you know, let me show you that really quick. This one right here. Okay. So I'm just gonna go to my cloud portal, which is the automation cloud. Okay. And the moment you land, you'll be on your home screen. So if you do have like your default uh, tenant and the service that's been defined, yeah, this is really slow for me. And pardon me, it's my machine. Okay. And I've been having a little bit of issue. But as soon as it loads, like you would see that like from the cloud portal on the home screen, you would see like services, okay? As you can see, it displays the orchestrated services. So if you do have multiple services, you can choose whichever one that you have defined, but by default, you would have at least one, or you can like even access it using this orchestrator. And my service, like my orchestrator is called exploration. So I'm gonna click on that meaning that I'm going into my orchestrator, okay? So inside that you can have various folders or you can just use my folder, meaning like your personal space, okay? And inside that you would see this different menu options, okay? So if you're on tenant by default, it should go here, but if you're by any chance on this, just click on your folder, like click on my folders. And all we're gonna do is like go to assets, okay? And here's where like, I'm gonna build my first configuration, okay? So I'll show you. You can give like any kind of name to your asset to say like, okay, this is what I wanna store. So you need to like specify what is it that I'm going to store? Okay, imagine I want to store a specific uh, URL or a certain text or even that email subject, okay? For instance, if I wanna store that email subject here, instead of every time me changing it there, I'm gonna change it here, okay? So in our case, the email subject was a text. So I'm not going to change that type here. I'm just going to leave it with text. And I'm just going to say, this is an automated email. Okay. And then I will just say create. Okay. You can even give it a description to say like, what is that? And then like hit create. The moment you do that, you would see that asset being created here. Okay, and again, when you take a look at it, you can choose uh, what different types of like assets that you can say. Okay, so you can choose to save a Boolean value or an integer in case of like you're storing any kind of account numbers or like specific values, you can use that. 
and you know the most uh, secure one secure way to store your uh, you know like username and password because most of us when we use our application sometimes you may have single sign on meaning that you just like pull up your if you're within your company network it will pull it pull it up but if you have a system that has a login screen that says like enter your username and password it's highly recommended to use this asset of type credential okay so this way like once i create like let's say like i'll just say like my uh, gmail credential okay i'm just gonna say what's my gmail credential here okay so i i give it a name i chose the type credential and i'm just gonna like save a username okay I'm just gonna say like a at gmail.com, like, okay. So you just specify the name. And you know, the beauty of these credentials is that like once you type in the password, you can just like check it, okay? You can just check it once and like once you hit create, that's it. You cannot go back and like see like what's the value. So uh, you have to hold on to your credentials, but this credentials that's being like held here, will be used by the automation but again it will not be uh, visible to anybody else so if i go back and say like let's say i want to edit that asset and a way to do that i probably did that too fast is that you see like i highlight this asset and there are three dots in that specific asset and i just hit edit here the moment i do that as you can see i cannot like come back and like see that password okay so you can like be very relaxed knowing that like your password is not going to be visible like if you if you have like a shared orchestrator with somebody else your passwords are not going to be like uh, you know like leaked to somebody else so always like remember like you can store your credentials and this is like one of the best ways to use it for your automation Okay, and this is highly recommended because like imagine if you were to like use your credentials as a simple string format. Anybody who has access to that XAML file, let's say I zip this file up and I send it over to you, you can see the credentials if it's in a string format, which is not very secure in today's age, right? So which is why I, uh, it's highly recommended to use the assets there, okay? And so now we know like how to create those assets within the orchestrator, but how to use them in your automation, okay? So you've put them in the world, like you've put them in that centralized location, which is the orchestrator assets. So in order for you to use them, to consume them, Studio provides you two activities, okay? The get asset and the get credential. So remember like how we saw the four different types of assets that we can store, the text, the Boolean, the integer, and the credential. Except the credential, the rest of the types can be used, uh, can be consumed using this get asset. So you can just see here, like once you type the get asset, there's an activity of that name. And all I'm gonna do is just drag and drop. And the moment you have that, okay, I just pulled it down here. I'll just pull it up for you. Okay, so as you can see, it just needs two things. Okay, give me the asset name and like, where do I store this value? Okay, so in my case, like one thing that you need to uh, validate that like you're connected to the right orchestrator. Okay, sometimes like not being connected to the right orchestrator, especially if you're using like multiple accounts, like working on a different client machine or like a different network and you're connected to a different orchestrator, then you may not see the same one. So just make sure that you're accessing the same orchestrator portal, okay? And once you're there, all you need to do is just like specify. So in this case, I have like two assets here. Okay, the first one is called the Google URL. Like I'm just gonna call this asset as like a URL that I need to navigate to. So I'm just gonna call this asset of type text, Google URL, and I'm gonna like put that in, okay? So this is the URL that I just need to navigate to. And now I need to access this Google URL. So whatever value that it says here, I want it on my studio, okay? So what I'll do is just specify that name Google URL and I will create a variable here, okay? So this is my local variable and remember how to create a variable, what's the shortcut key? Control K, okay? So we use the control K to create our variable. So I just created a variable that says like Google URL and then 
since I already have that created, it won't let me do that, okay? So I've created a variable now and then I can print it, okay? So now when I uh, run this, it's gonna like print this Google URL, okay? Now let's see like how to, um, I'm gonna run this as soon as I show you the credential as well. So next, I wanna show you how to access those credentials that we put in there. So we can call this get credential activity, okay? Once you drop that in, then I would specify what's the asset name that we gave here. So I'm going to show you like the Oracle credentials that I just have created. And I'm calling it Oracle credential, a username and a password. Okay. Once you do that, I just need to specify the asset name. And in this case, since there are two components, which is the username and password, it asked me to create two variables. Okay. Again, just go ahead and use the shortcut keys, control K and create your variable for username and also for the password. One thing, if you notice, if you go to the variables panel, the password is again of not type string. It's not a simple string. It is of type secure string, meaning that like it's already encrypted. So whenever you type it into your system, it's in the masked format and it's not being like exposed. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. And you should be able to see this soon. And I'm only printing the username. I'm not printing the uh, password because even if I print, it's just going to say it's a secure string. So as you can uh, see here, the URL is being pulled from the orchestrator, the asset that we have created. And also the username is coming from the credential asset. Okay. So again, this comes in very handy when you're using the... Um, configurations like any type of system configuration okay next we're moving on to the orchestrator queues so imagine that queues are like list of items that your automation needs to like do again like when you are automating a process you're not just like automating like a single task you might have like to repeat that task like several times for like various number of like items like work items and these queues like are providing you to like a placeholder for you to like say like, where can I put that list of things that needs to be processed? And this is where like you can like design, like now we come into the concept of like, you know, designing your solution. So when you put it into a queue, now you have to like separate your process into like two separate parts to say like, okay, now I wanna have like a dispatcher that actually like puts items into the queue. And then there is like an actual robot performer that goes and pulls items from the queue to say like, okay, now I can have N number of robots to like go get all the items. So I can have like five robots at the same time running from that queue. So from that list, like, you know, instead of just one robot, like doing it for like one hour, like you can have like five robots and get it done in like 10 minutes. So that's the beauty of queues. Like it gives you that component of like, you know, like handling all of this. So I'm just going to quickly show you like how queues are being loaded. Okay. So for you to like use the queues, let me just see my machine. There we go. So for you to use the queues, I'm just going to like use a notepad here because I have that. I'm just gonna create a queue with that name, okay? So all I do is just go to the queues. I'm just gonna create it with a simple name. And again, you can give your queue, uh, queue name associated with your process or the type of items that it's gonna hold. Like what is the what is what is it uh, being like held? Like what type of data? It can be like invoice queue or like you know like it can be like transactions or any type of like name. Give it a meaningful name. Okay, and the moment you do that, your queue gets created. And right now I'm just gonna like view the transactions to see like what's inside my queue. So as you can see, the queue is just blank. It's just like empty. So we can basically like create a queue with like N number of items. So whatever that you wanna store inside a queue, you can define it and you can upload it to the queue. So you, you have like various ways to like import data into the queue. I'm just gonna show you like one simple way. So I just have a simple Excel with like a couple of columns, one with just a ticket number, a priority description and a contact, okay? 
So these items, I just want to be placed into the queue. So for that, I'll just use this. Um, So I'm just going to show you like once I hit run here, like all I do is like use that Excel to populate these queues here. Okay, so while it's running, I'll just quickly show you. So all I'm doing is like if you remember the Excel automation activities, what we do is like we use a read range. Uh, and in this case, I'm not going to use the Excel scope. I'm just going to use the workbook uh, activity since it's just like one single step. So I was just say like read range and like you can just use that, uh, call that Excel and specify what's the sheet name and give an output to the data table, okay? And to access the data table, I'm gonna use a for each uh, loop and then put in that data table, okay? And once that's done, I'm just gonna define the queue. So to add those queue into, uh, to add each of those row into that queue, I'm going to use an activity called as add queue item. So if you just type in in your activities, you will see this add queue item. Okay. So with each specific row, it gets added here. Okay. So in this, for us to configure this, I'm going to specify what's the queue name. We just gave it a name called RPA Summer School Queue. That's going to be my queue name. And I'm going to specify what folder it's in. And in this case, I'm just gonna give it like a unique reference. And so what's my unique key here is gonna be the ticket number, okay? And all the items that we had, I'm just gonna add it here under this item information. So you can just specify this item information and click on these three dots and then you can like pull up. So if you just like click create argument and first I'm gonna say like, um, I'm gonna create a type contact and I'm gonna add that data row, like each specific row gets added. So based on that, like I'm gonna add all of these items and then I hit run, meaning that I'm gonna populate all these rows into the queue. So as you can see, like sometimes it just doesn't refresh. So use this refresh button for you to see that. So we had three rows, all three items are here. So remember like how the ticket number was the unique key? that is being displayed under this reference column, okay? So if you wanna see more data, like what's the transaction information, you can just click on the details. So whatever that you defined in that item collection here, item information here, that is what gets displayed there. So we had the contact, the extended, uh, exceeded SLA, the ticket description and the ticket priority, all of them are being displayed here, okay? So if you want to like access this, so we talked about like two separate processes, right? So this is what we just did, like uploading to the queue is called the dispatcher, meaning that you're dispatching your items into the queue. So that is the dispatcher. Now I can build a completely separate process with a brand new project just to like work on these queue items, just to, just to get these queue items to be executed, okay? So for that one, like I will just say, use an activity called as get transaction item. Okay, so I'll just say, look for an activity called get transaction item and use that activity. Again, for this activity to work, you need to specify which queue am I getting from because you can have multiple queues. You can have one for invoice, you can have one for like, you know, purchase orders. So you can have multiple ones. So you have to specify what's your queue using your queue name. And here I specify my um, folder path and I define the output variable. Okay, all you need to do is just do a control K and define it, okay? And as you can see, I'll show you this variable type. This is a UiPath specific one, uh, UiPath specific data type, that's the queue item, okay? So this is a proprietary uh, data type that is uh, gonna store this queue item, okay? And once you get the transaction, the moment you get the transaction, it goes into in progress. And once you're done, like, you know, like you can act, uh, work with like different systems. Like let's imagine you got the item. Now you're going into SAP doing some activities and then you're done with that. And you need to like um, say that this was successful or this was failed. You can use an activity called set transaction status. So for each of those rows, you can specify whether it was successful or failed. So in that case, I'm again going to use that variable, that queue item variable that we just had. 
specify that and here's a status here's where like you can say whether that it was successful or failed and if it was failed like give like what was the reason like that it failed was it a business reason or an application and specify why did it fail okay so that's how we get the cues okay next thing is like quickly i'll show you like how to publish a project i'm sorry like we are running a little uh, over our time here Diana, I'm really sorry about that, but I uh, hope. It's okay. This is good this information. Thank you guys for sticking around. So quickly, you've built your automation, okay? Now you want to like push it to the orchestrator, hand it to that central uh, control system for you to make those configurations and send it out, okay? In that case, all you need to do is go to your studio, make sure there are no errors, okay? And if, you, if you're not sure whether you have errors, always say like validate file or validate project. And moment you run it, it's gonna pull up the error panel if it has any errors, okay? But if you don't have any errors, come in here and hit publish and make sure that you're connected to the orchestrator. So once you have that, you can just give it a package name. And here's where you specify like, okay, you have a current version and then it's gonna be a new, new version. This is the version number. But um, let's say you're working in a development team and like you have like multiple different versions and you guys are like, uh, you know, like having several releases, you can just say pre-release, meaning that it's not the real, you know, like a finalized version. In that case, it's, it's just there, but, um, most of the time, just leave it with this newer version and put in a release notes. This is a highly recommended best practice before you publish, like just specify why are you publishing? Like what is the change that uh, that is being made? So if it's the first time that you're publishing a, a specific automation, just put in like, what's the description? Just a two liner. In this case, let's say this is a string manipulation process. So I would just say that and just define like what that process is in just like a line or two, not more than that, okay? And then you would just say like uh, hit next and you can like go to your default tenant. And if you if there are certain organizations where you might have like a specific different NuGet feed or a marketplace, you can always choose that. And that's just an option available for you. And I would just like hit next. And if you do want to like, uh, have a, spe a specific certificate sign, you can do that. But the moment I hit publish, it's gonna publish that package and you should see this information, okay? That says like it was published successfully, okay? And this was the name. So now that we have published it, like all it means is like you like packaged it, you've just tied the ribbon to it, okay? You've just like made your package beautiful, but now you need to deploy it, okay? You've just given that package, but it needs to be like really like implemented if it makes sense, okay? So for us to do that, what I'm gonna do is how to deploy it. Jeez, go back. Okay, so I'm just gonna go to our uh, folder here and if you just go to hit automations and my package should normally be there, but it's not defined as a process. So that's kind of like, it can be quite tricky. Okay, so I'm just gonna call it session four demo. So if you look for your process name, which is why I like your process name is very important for you to find it, okay? So name your process is very meaningful and short, okay? Once you have that, you just select that package source and here's where you define like additional options that are available for you to like make your uh, process more meaningful. And I will just hit next. And here are some of the assets that we are using, the uh, arguments that are available. And here's a display name, okay? I can give a more, you know, like that was probably more technical to say like session four, but if I were to give it a more meaningful name, like, you know, just more friendly, name then i would just call it like summer school and this part four like you can just give it like any name and just make sure that it's more meaningful and the moment you hit create like you can either like start this or you can schedule it using the triggers but i'm not going to do that for now i'm just going to make sure that my process is available and again there's a ton of processes out here 
So if you go out and see like your process is already out there, the RPA summer school is right here, okay? So now it's available for you to run. So if you even like had to pull up your assistant and like look for your process, this process should be available, okay? And, uh, oh, geez. So I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it over to Diana for another fun question. Okay. Okay, this is our last question tonight, you guys. So get ready. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to make sure you're all ready. Okay, here we go. Wish you all the best, guys. Let's see who wins the prize for tonight. I'm going to refresh it. Here we go. Question four. Don't forget to answer quickly. What is the best way to store credentials, username and password for the automation? Orchestrator assets, safe box, bank vault, or post it note? I know bank vault sounds very uh, enticing. <laughs> But again, like, think of it, guys. If you put it there, like your robot <laughs> to go and get it, that's very <laughs> difficult. But thank you. You have been listening. You have been. As it is. Okay, let's see who's the champion for tonight. All right. Sorry. Oh. Great. So if you will put your your name and your email address in the chat. I will send you a prize right after this session. Thank you so much. Um, and Priya, um, we had a question on the forum. I was wondering if you would mind um, just looking, yep. just going through that a little bit. Okay, yeah. Okay, so someone has a question on like how to ask a question. Just the basics on how forms are set up for contribution and okay. asking questions. Sure, let me just pull that out. So I, I put, just so everybody knows, I did put our forum link in the chat. So if you want to grab that, that will connect you to the people on this call um, who are taking the session. And then, you know, our MVPs will be part of that too, which makes it really easy for you. Okay, I got that. So I'm just going to share my screen one more time, Diana, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So here we have like Christina's post here that she started the thread that says like, okay, about all our different four sessions that we have had. So uh, if you click on the link that Diana just shared, it will take you to this link out here. And by this time, I'm pretty sure you all are like logged into your, you know, like with your single sign on. And again, like if you have never used forum, just come in here, just use this link and, you know, like just hit reply. Like if you do have any questions at all, just come here, hit reply and ask your question. Just type in your question. And let's say like, I can even like paste any images like, oh, I don't have any screenshots, but if you've grabbed any screenshots or like if you have like any file attachments or if you're stuck in your workflow and you don't know like what's happening, especially, you know, like with those error handling and it could be tricky if you're not sure, like it, it helps us a lot to help you uh, way easier is if you attach that workflow. So you can always just copy that workflow and just drag and drop it here and then like just type in your reply and give it like explain like what's your situation that you're seeing okay once you're done then hit reply and again that was just a test so i'm not going to post it but if you had any questions just come to this post the very first uh, post that christina has you can just hit reply and like ask your question here that's a very easy way for us to handle. So here you can see like Brian has already like posted some of the uh, solution. 
So if you want to share like your entire workflow, you can just zip up your file and just share it out here. Or you can even just like, you know, post just the screenshots of what you're seeing. Okay, this helps us like we always like try to monitor here. So if you have like any question, giving us a screenshot and like explaining what your situation is helps us get the results faster. And in general, even after the summer school is over, again, like, please don't forget, just come back to this UiPath forum. And if you're like doing any other automations and if you're stuck, just use the search button here, okay? So first use the search button, type your question. Just like, it can be like any silly question, just type it out here. And again, like, everybody has come across that situation. So you're not alone. So you might not be the just very first person to come across that. So in that case, look up your solution. It may have been answered like 10 different times. And it's just like pick a solution and try it out. There are like uh, work steps, like solutions that are available. And it would have already been marked as like, you know, a solution. And if you cannot find your answers of what you're looking for, just come here create a new topic and like select what's your topic based on. And like here you need to like say like, okay, I'm using like a specific uh, question, a reboot your skill question. In that case, I would just like specify like, okay, what's my um, questions that I have? And I don't think we have an option for summer school. So forget about the summer school, but like this is post summer school. If you do have any question, specify like, where are you seeing this issue? Either you might be stuck like not knowing how to configure orchestrator or like how to do studio. Like you can always like look it up. But before you post your question, always first rule is like a rule of thumb that I would say is like, come and use the search. And this is like a very good place. Again, this is a global community. So if people in the US time zone are not available, there's always like someone on, across the globe that will be like available to help you, okay? Thanks, Priya. So um, I do want to thank you all for coming tonight. I especially want to thank Priya for a great presentation, um, Logan for coming and helping us from UiPath, and you have a, a cameo appearance tonight from Christina the Do, who um, we're lucky to have because she lives in a me and it's quite late for her, but she put this whole program together. So just want to do a big shout out to her. Thank you, Priya, for uh, this great session and for backing us up. Amazing session. And thank you, Diana, for all the effort. Yeah, thanks for coming. You know, it's been a wonderful two weeks for everybody, but hard. <laughs> yes. So just remember, you guys, we're all still here. Um, just go through the forum um, if you need to contact us or have any questions. And thanks again for um, spending time with us. You will get a email next week with a quiz and um, and that's how you'll get your certificate. Thanks so much. Yes. So everybody will get on Thursday next week an email with an invitation to take the quiz. And uh, if you pass the quiz, you will be able to download the diploma for the RPA summer school. And of course, you will also receive uh, tomorrow the recording and the PPT by email and on the event link. So you will have access before the quiz to all the content from the RPA Summer School to be able to look back or rehearse. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys have been wonderful crowd. Again, like keep learning. And I'm pretty sure all of you will pass out with successful flying colors, okay? So yes. good luck. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye-bye, everyone. -bye.